Yeah, the account started. Yeah, so Pala, you're finishing up with last week's question first, or? Yeah, I can go over it. So like, so last week we had, you guys had some issues regarding the graded assignments, right? So in regards to it, I just looked at it and like I manually made, corrected all those mistake questions and also you should be, the marks will, would have been changed like in that. Uh, okay, okay. So uh, are you saying that the changes will be reflected on the portal itself or they will only come up once the evaluation is done? I think it will be coming up. And I, I send. I looked at the papers and sent it to them. Like they said, they made the changes in their side. I think during the evaluation, it might come up. Okay, okay, okay. Because uh, as of now, uh, if I check the portal, the errors are still visible. Um, okay, and then I think it's not. It. I don't think you might not have gotten it. Uh, like, okay, okay. But I uh, did. I did. In, I did inform them of the changes, and they did make the changes. So. Like in okay, so, so, uh, can you please uh, confirm the exact changes that you've made? For example, uh, question 16 of graded assignment one mm -hmm. uh, that has been changed to ribosome, right? Yeah. So, like, the thing is, like, so it's kind of ambiguous. So, I've given marks for both ribosomes and the people who put that as RNA protein. Both got the answer correct. I've given marks for both of them. Okay. So okay. That's uh, the part for that. Okay. And can you explain the difference between the two, if possible? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, you can do that later. Yeah, you can just go over the changes first. So uh, that is one. The other one was uh, that uh, the question with uh, all the uh, it was regarding the nanopore question. Yeah, both Oxford nanopore and uh, Oxford. the other one, public Pacific Biosciences. Yeah, that has also been changed to given marks for like if you return both, you're get, getting marks. And if you're at an A, any one of them, you're also giving marks like half a mark. Okay, okay. Since they're both uh, are correct. So if you wrote one, you get half marks. You wrote both, you get full marks. For that. Oh, all right. Okay, okay. And then there's the question six, I guess. The change in current nanopore. There was an issue regarding, because like there's an excess space issue, the, right. it was not like, taking the correct answer. So that I've checked and everyone, like pretty much all of, it was the same for everyone, so all of, all of you guys get marks for the question, pretty much. Poor wrote a lot. So okay, change so in sure. current nanopore, the that I've checked it. So whoever wrote change in current nanopore, they are getting the marks for that. Right, right, okay. So, so uh, I think uh, going forward, I, I have a suggestion. Um, mm -hmm. If if possible, can we not have these types of questions? This type as in the like putting in strings as answers because mm -hmm. anyway we are just copying from whatever options that have already been given uh, it's mm -hmm. possible it is better to have those as an msq type question similar to the other questions that we have yeah i think it can be because these formatting issues uh, can sometimes lead yeah, to yeah, these yeah, yeah yeah i see what you point i see your point so yeah you can you can have you can change those like going like in the upcoming right right sir and uh, can you explain the difference between the RNA protein complex and ribosome for the other question? Uh, for well, basically, essentially, like our ribosome is an RNA protein complex. Right, right, yeah. So, uh, um, so it's RNA protein complex is, uh, that's kind of like, both are, it's a redundant option, both RNA protein and ribosomes, it's, uh, so. So I'll maybe remove either of I remove the RNA protein complex and upcoming things and just keep it as ribosome in that option. Got it. Got it. Sure, sir. Is there a term uh, such as ribosome complex? Ribosome is a complex of proteins and RNAs, rRNA to be specific. So the calling Ribo there's no such thing as a ribosome complex, but ribosome itself is, is a complex of RNAs and proteins. Okay, in that question, if you put ribosome, it the sentence reads as ribosome. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, no, no, that thing that the question has to be reframed, I kind of like to remove the complex part. That question has to be reframed. I, it was my error on my part for not checking that actually. That will be rectified. If you guys return as ribosome or RNA protein companies, I've given you the marks, so it's fine. So 
so those were the only things right you, you guys needed like regarding the assignments right oh uh, was there anything else you guys wanted to discuss uh, okay. yeah so uh, uh, talking about the errors specifically yeah those were the only three questions mm -hmm. that were erroneous but uh, I, I felt that uh, the other question in grade assignment one that, that we were discussing in the last week, uh, proteomics versus epigenomics, mm -hmm. uh, which one helps us differentiate between uh, diseased uh, variants? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, personally, I have gone with uh, epigenomics as was suggested, but mm -hmm. uh, I still feel that transcriptomics should also be an acceptable answer for, for the last question. I mean, if if not, then uh, uh, a discourse post clarifying the same would be very helpful, because professor okay. talks about both those uh, uh, yeah. omics data sets in in the context of differentiating between various strains, uh, diseased mm -hmm. versus uh, uh, non-diseased, or uh, differentiating between various populations. Mm -hmm. Like it so, depends on the like uh, like differentiating between a diseased population and this thing depends on what. Uh, you, you, what can say, is. you can say you can say genomics also like. If it's a mutation that's that's causing the disease, people having that mutation can be like that, right? Right, right. So uh, in that case, questions such as these, uh, where multiple options can be correct, depending mm -hmm. on the perspective. Uh, yeah. For example, if you have anything like that in the exam, what are we supposed to do with it? Should we select anyone or should we select all or how should we proceed in that? That case? for those cases, there, there's a clear distinction. So like, so you have like, for the exam, I've given it as multiple select questions for it. So like MCQs will only have only one answer. Right, right. So if we have the option of multiple things, it's coming as, as an MSQ, MSQ type of question, like, like you have in the graded assignments. Right, right, yeah. Where you can select multiple options. Got it, yeah. But I in the quiz like in the quiz I've like kind of make sure like the, the questions are not this ambiguous. Mm, yeah, it's yeah. I mean that, that's all I wanted to say. That, that, that's yeah, it's it. clear cut. You, you you'll be able to like figure out what it is. Okay, sir. Got it. Yeah, that if you won't have in your yes yes Abhishek. So so uh, I have general uh, queries from week one and week two and then from week three to. So <clears throat> may I ask now, or I have to ask like at the end of the session? You can uh, for week one, we do you can ask. So for week one, like uh, for the uh, general confusing thing is for me, like uh, uh, it was said that uh, uh, DNA is present in the chromosomes, right? So uh, I just wanted to clarify whether all the cells contain all the twenty-three cross of chromosomes, or yes. okay. All the oh. cells will have all your all the twenty. Yes, all cells will have that. So that is twenty-two autosomes and one sex chromosome. Right? Yes, yes, that is present in all of your cells. Okay. So uh, the second question is uh, when we are doing hum uh, human genome project. So mm -hmm. why it has taken that much time? Like uh, because uh, is the. Uh, genetic material that is dna was collected from only uh, one or two people or it was collected all over the places you're talking about the original human genome project right huh you're talking about the first human genome project right right which was around 2002 and something i think that was from us i think it was from a person from us from a single person i think I'm not mistaken at the reach I think. But the reason to why it took a long time is because during the time there were we didn't have like these Illumina sequencing and all those things to like speed up the process. Okay, and coming back to the Illumina sequencing as well, or even Sanger sequencing. So there are some overlapping sequences. So how that how did uh yeah like how we will deal with the overlapping things, how we will conclude that. Because we are ultimately eventually uh, dividing the DNA into small fragments, right? Yeah. We are uh, producing the uh, whole lot uh, like uh, sequence. So there might be chances of error as well no? when we are overlapping. Yeah. Yes, there are like that's that the thing is like uh, there's something called. Uh, 
like the depth of the sequence like how many it will be like the whole thing will be the process will be repeated multiple times and to like minimize the error actually like so repeated multiple times means say you you will run the gel for the multiple times not it's the running of the gel calling of it it's like uh, that is like a old technique of how here like people i think in sangers right now we will sangers you don't like uh, uh, sequence the entire genome see in sangers no no that i got like mm -hmm. if you have like a sequence of around 500 uh, or like 5000 nucleotides mm -hmm. so you want over the illumina sequencing directly that is that is a costly thing but if you go for the sangers sequencing then uh, there are different chances like doing a like you are breaking the genetic uh, material into different fragment and then you are sequencing it so that's in that case i am asking like how do you resolve that uh, overlapping things and also like uh, how that error should was is minimizing so i uh... in sangar it's run as a single thing right like you can go up to like somewhere like 1000 base pairs or something like you can run it so in sangar usually you send it for a single uh, right now people what they do is they just sequence maybe a gene or two okay so you have these sequences which are like um, if you break it down you have a reference right now currently we have a reference sequence which we can like use it to like align it and figure out the see entire sequence of that thing but if we, how we will align we don't know the sequence and initially we don't know that's why we are initially we didn't know yeah initially the thing with people look for is the patterns of like they look for align the sequence they look for patterns and try to like overlap them and like can try to construct a thing no no but how we will uh, like find out those patterns there yeah, some property associated with it that's like do you have the string okay. which is like atgc like okay. thing right right so you will So it's a sequence, right? It's it's a sequence of strings. Yeah, it's a sequence of strings. Correct. So it will have some like uh, particular pattern along with it. So if it's as uh, for a a t t t and g g c, it's one sequence towards the end, and somewhere in that adult thing, it's in the middle of something. You don't if you, like if you compare like four or five c five c five stretches of like nucleotides, it's hard. but if you like take a longer sequence for example and find to find a pattern among it there will be pattern side right? no no that is, that i understand there might be a pattern because you know, there are only four nucleotides involved in it mm -hmm. okay but uh, by seeing merely seeing the dna we can't see because we won't able to see the dna if we like extract it from the cells it is not even visible that is a liquid thing and we are not marking it like from the uh, i would say naked eye we can't say that it, it it is a sequence of atg yeah yeah that's why we have these things called in like for example in sangers you have these called dd and mm -hmm. dd and piece but currently we are using uh, dd piece which are marked with fluorophores which okay. gives out fluorescence okay so when they are excited so so when they are incorporated when they are incorporated into they have like a fluorophore which can be detected like it a will give us a, a will give a like say a red red color sequencing i know i understand sangar sequencing i got the the principle behind is you know dye new uh, that is we are using the different type of nucleotide instead of the original one yeah that uh, will uh, produce some kind of colors when we hmm. put them into uv light so that is Uh, that mm. thing I understand, but okay. But let let's coming. Uh, let's come to the RNA sequencing. So, 
what we are doing in the RNA sequencing, there are two types of methods, like one is microarray and another, another one is RNA set. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing, we first convert the RNA into DNA. Yeah, CDNA, yeah, basically. CDNA, that is a complementary DNA through the process of uh, reverse transcription. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we are doing the reverse transcription, we are like RNA is a single strand. Yes. But we are doing the, we are uh, forming the DNA out of it. Like, so mm -hmm. will that DNA be double stranded or single stranded? It, it will be a single stranded one. But uh, how like? DNA how? can be single stranded. DNA can be single stranded. Yeah, it's a single stranded stretch of DNA. So. The thing, uh, the, the reason why you're doing for, uh, you, you've not seen uh, like the differences between DNA and RNA, right? No, I know the difference. I know the difference between them, but generally, um, you know, on a general note, DNA is a double standard structure and uh, it exists as a, it like in our cell, DNA exists as a double standard thing, but okay. there are single standard DNAs. Okay. So, okay, but in that environment, we are forming the single stranded uh, DNA, okay? Yeah. So, let's say we have some sequence that is A, U, C, G, something like that of RNA. Mm -hmm. We are forming the DNA out of it. Mm -hmm. So, it is the complementary strand kind of. Yes. Strand. So, yes. when we are taking the, so we are, now we are sequencing that complementary DNA. Mm -hmm. So, do we have to manually compute the uh, structure of the RNA? With the help of that complementary uh, DNA or structure doesn't come. It's the sequence we are reading. We are reading the sequence. Okay. It is sequence, sequence only. Yeah, we are reading the sequence, and then you can can like you can like take a complement of it. It will give you the RNA sequence. Okay. The reason we are doing making a complementary DNA is because RNA is very unstable. It's easy to RNA gets degraded pretty easily. So and DNA, is yeah? any specific reason for it? For so, it? Yeah, it, there's a reason. So you have this uh, ribose background, right? Sugar background. Mm -hmm. Both DNA and RNA both has this ribose thing. But the DNA has something called deoxyribose. Right. So one OH group on that two, two prime position, it will be not there. Okay. And, but RNA has the two prime OH group. So that two prime OH group is the reason it may it is less stable. That kind of makes it more prone to hydrolysis. Hydrolysis reaction. Okay. So uh, do we able to find like uh, like DNA is forming according to the central dogma? DNA is a converted into RNA first okay mm -hmm. and then we are doing the uh what we if we wanted to know the sequence of the RNA mm -hmm. so we are doing the reverse but but can we able to find out what are the original sequence of the DNA gene from which this RNA is produced yeah you can so uh, the DNA Original, the RNA is your like the sequence of the gene from which it was transcribed, right? But there are some post uh, transcription in this. It doesn't change the sequence. No, no. The same. I'm talking about like the, when we remove those exons and introns. Introns, or, yes. No, introns when we remove the introns. Mm -hmm. Because that is ultimately move out to uh, nucleus and move. Move to the cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. So all... you take his DNA and you sequence it. Mm -hmm. You have something called starts start codons and stop codons. Starting said this thing, right? Right. By looking for those, you can find the ORFs in a gene in oh, a nucleotide right? sequence. Open what reading things. This is all. Oh. Yes, sir. Busy. Yeah, yeah, okay. So ORF. So just do you, if you take the stretch of those, you can actually say that this is a, this has a 
this part of the DNA is, has a coding this thing and it codes for a particular gene. But uh, initially DNA is a very long strand. Yes, you can, you can, yes, there are programs which you can look through it. Okay. Yeah, it is a okay. long strand. It is just, but at the end of the day, you can, people have done that and they have made databases for that, which you can use and easily, and there are tools to identify or have seen in a genome and all that. So in this open reading frame, is it a unique for each uh, gene or like? Yes, uh, each okay. gene has its own sequence and and, e and those sequences code for a different protein, which will do a different function. So yeah, each ORFs are different, but they do have the start, the usual start codon and the stop codon, which is AUG and the stop. AUG is the start codon. Okay, so let's say we have a 30,000 genes. So all genes that have 30,000 uh, uh, open reading frames. Yeah. And those 30,000 sequences are unique. Yeah, for the, yes. Okay, fine, thank you. Okay. So other things you can start with, I think you Ram and Aarti, they will be here for like week three. Yeah, I think uh, from our side, uh, Sauma will uh, start sharing his screen. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, share my screen. Yeah, so the three of uh, the three TAs for this Week three, four, five, and six would be myself, Arti, and then Yuvaram and Soma. Uh, so uh, the whole idea of these, like the slides, is so we'll go over, uh, like go over the topics that has been already covered in week three, uh, just as an overview, and then at the end we'll uh, solve some questions, and in the middle, wherever you have doubts. Uh, uh, we'll stop after each slide. You can ask your questions then. Okay. Uh, so let's get started first. So now first is uh, we'll start from very basics, types of graphs. So this has been uh, discussed uh, by Sir in, uh, in in the in the in the course videos. So basically, we have a we have a lot of types of gra graphs that includes undirected, directed, weighted, bipartite, multi-edge, hypergraphs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I have written down some definitions for them. You could go through them, but in the next slide, I have some examples for that. I think that would be better to understand each type. So if you follow from uh, uh, panel number D, so D is an undirected graph. So like each of the uh, the, the, the nodes are connected by edges which have no direction but in case of the directed graph you have you see uh, directed edges uh, next comes semantic graphs so semantic graphs if you look at the definition of semantic graphs uh, okay so i have not put it here so basically semantic graphs are uh, graphs that have uh, information on its edges as well so it kind of like you can think of its example as some uh, like uh, as in uh, used in genome assembly where we have different kind of tumors which we overlap and we find uh, the sequence so on the edge on the nodes also contain information the edges also con contain information about the whole uh, graph structure so those kind of structures are called the semantic graphs next we have weighted graphs so each of the way uh, each of the edges of the graph will carry some weight and that is denoted by the thickness of the uh, of the edge of the graph. So basically, more thick uh, 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 is equivalent to more stronger connections. For example, between three and four. Next, uh, uh, we have mixed graphs. So we have directed, undirected elements within the same graph itself. Next, we have bipartite. So basically, you have two sets of uh, nodes so one two three is a set of node four five six seven is another set of node so uh, the the edges run between one set to another but they do not uh, run within the set so basically one two three here 
is connected to 4, 5, 6, 7, but it is not connected to each other. Same is the case of 4, 5, 6, 7. So basically, you have two sets, and they just go between the two sets, but they do not form within the sets itself. And <clears throat> next is multi-edge graphs. So these are kind of two edge nodes can have multiple edges between them. And uh, this is the uh, uh, number K is a hypergraph. So hypergraph, as you can see, uh, the edges are on are being generated from another edge only so you can imagine this as uh, like uh, in, in metabolic networks or biochemical networks where one uh, your substrate will give some product but the intermediate can give out some other products as well so it's kind of that re representation so these are the different types of graphs uh, according to like the edge uh, uh, properties and uh, how they are connected <clears throat> If you have any questions, you can ask, or else we'll move on to the next slide. Can the hypergraph be represented in any other way? Um, you're talking about this? OK, yes. OK, uh, any other way as in, like, uh, I, I'm not getting the question. So, so you want to represent it? I think in the lecture, it was shown in a slightly different way. Okay, but uh, it's shown as a link this... between. Um, um, uh, it, it was, I think, an author, co-author example. Ha. Ha. That 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 was a like what to say. Uh, that's a particular example for that. I am talking about the structures of the graph. So, okay. like basically, uh, yeah, I'm generalizing on the structure. I'm not going into particular examples. So, uh, I am defining the different types of graphs according to their structures. Basically. So uh, then, moving on to the next part is first parameter of the of the graphs that we study is connectivity or degree. It's basically uh, a node how it is connected to other nodes. So it's it is denoted by k, and in case of weighted graphs, you have in in degrees, uh, meaning uh, edges coming into the node, and in case of uh, you and also have out degrees where the edges are going out of the node. So basically, your total degree will be summation of your in and out degrees. So for undirected networks, you can see uh, the total number of links. If you add them up, it comes as uh, one by two. Uh, like here, k one, k two, k three are in, uh, are being denoted as each node and uh, equal to two, equal to three, equal to two, equal to one denotes the number of edges uh, associated with each node. So the total number of links will be uh, one by two uh, summation of all the uh, uh, basically degrees of all the nodes together. And if, if, if you want the average degree, you just divide it by n. In case of directed networks, it will be, uh, it, as I said, you have to take the in degree and the out degree separately. So it will be uh, basically summation of all the in degrees and summation of all the out degrees. And for the average degree, you just need to divide by n. So this is uh, a basic overview of connectivity or degree of a, of a node, basically. So uh, when we define, when we say degree of a directed graph, then we refer to its in degree or out degree? We refer to the total degree. So if you, if you can see here, we if you uh, if you refer to the total degree of a, of a directed node uh, of a of a node in a directed graph, it's basically the summation of the in degrees and the out degrees. So in directed graph, you'll have some uh, edges that will come in into the node, and you'll have some edges that are going outside. So the total degree will be just the summation of those degree, not individually in or out. So if you specify in degree, it's obviously uh, the number of edges coming, or the out degree is the number of edges out going out. But in general, it's just the summation of the two. OK. Uh, so okay. uh, I think in the yep. directed network, uh, the point number of links uh, that should be plus right instead of uh, equal to I guess. 
डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ द degrees of a nodes or of the nodes in a network so basically uh, it it will give you how many nodes have say degree of 1 or 2 or 3 or going up to what the maximum number of a degree uh, possible in, in in the node in the graph so it is basically giving you a distribution of how the uh, how the degrees are distributed across different nodes so uh it gives you a general overview of about how connected your graph is so uh i have given an example here uh, here in the in the plot so this is a basically the degree distribution of uh, saccharomyces cerevisiae seri, uh, gene regulatory network uh in this uh, degree distribution uh basically this follows a parallel network will not cover parallel network today that is a Uh, that is for the next week portion we'll cover it there but basically the idea is the number of nodes in the network having uh, i mean uh, the number of nodes having larger uh, uh, connections is lower than the number of nodes having lower connections so basically if you see uh, if you uh, imagine this to be the degree of the nodes and this to be the distribution so number if you see at 2 or 3 the number is very high but if you move towards the right and if your degree increases the number uh, the number of nodes generally increase so this is kind of a pattern that is seen in uh, real life networks uh, this is an example from saccharomyces cerevisiae but uh, you can see it in, uh, this kind of properties you can see it in almost any real life uh, 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 to be fair bi biochemical networks or biological biology related networks or even other networks as well So, uh, this should not be an histogram or graph. It's some of a bar chart because if you see clearly, it seems like a different thing. That is a continuous thing, but that is not the primary. No, it is basically a kernel density plot that is given. It, it's not continuous. The bins are actually connected. The points are connected to show continuity, but it's basically a kernel density plot. It is basically you can imagine a histogram, and if the all the top of the histogram is connected by a single line, you get a continuous curve. So, so that is, you can call. Is it a trend line? What we can say. Ha. Huh. This is this is basically uh, these points are basically uh, like say uh, uh, like number of basically if you if you imagine a degree distribution, a uh, deg uh, basically a degree cannot be like say point five. Uh, talking about say general undirected graph, if you take an example, a degree cannot be like two point five. Uh, so it it will not be continuous like that. So. basically you'll have bins so your your degree can be 2 or 2 uh, or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 like that and if you connect if you try to make a continuous distribution out of that you you make a kernel density plot that basically connects the top of the bins of each bin so basically you will get a curve that kind of uh, shows how it is how distrib how, how distributed your uh, degree is basically it is it is not continuous but you can like basically imagine and why there are two lines then uh this is basically taken from a from a different context so they were showing uh, some uh, like i think there there this is bi biological phenomenon and they were trying to explain i just took it as an example so there is okay. no for this context there is no relevance for two lines okay. yeah the easy way to look at it is in uh, the x axis if you just imagine they are the degrees of every node Like, uh, what are the degrees which are possible? You could have nodes with degree one, nodes with degree two, nodes with degree three, all the way up to more than twelve. So these are the degrees, and the y-axis could be the number of nodes having that degree. So if I were to interpret this graph like that, I would say using the solid red dots, I would say there are more than thousand nodes with degree one, and I would say that there are around 
less than 10 nodes with a degree of 12. So that's another way I can interpret the degree distribution. So this is somewhat like the frequency distribution. It's something like that, yes. And the trend just tells you, like, uh, if you want to put a name to it later, it just tells you what you can call that trend. That's all. Okay. Yeah. In, in this graph, have the often nodes been removed? Sorry? In this graph, have the orphan nodes been removed, nodes without any edges? Yeah, almost always when you study some of these things, uh, you connect, you study the largest connected component. You never study the entire graph. When you want to study network properties, you first see which is the largest connected component. That is, all those nodes should be connected in some way or the other. At least one edge they should have. And we analyze only those. So always in network X, when we do it, you should remove those unconnected nodes. I mean, uh, unless you want the node count, in which case I suppose they do need to be added in. Because they are also nodes in that graph. So if you ask for a node, a graph with 10 nodes, and it decides, and when you do a random network or something like that, and it decides that one or two nodes will not have edges, you still have to count them as nodes in the graph. But the network properties you analyze on connected components. Like the overall how dense a network is, and a lot of those things, it makes sense to analyze it on connected components. But some properties you'll take all the nodes into account. Okay, then, uh, moving on. So, uh, this is a uh, uh, continuation of degree distribution only. So, basically, uh, it if you, you can read through it, it, it talks about how it, how it provides a crucial uh, insight into the structure of the network. But uh, quickly, I want you to, like, as a, just a practice uh, uh, practice problem, just if you can compute all the degrees of all uh, of these 1 to 10 nodes in a couple of minutes, maybe. And this is the adjacent symmetrics of the, of the same uh, network. You can write your answers in the chat, we we'll, can we'll take a look at it. We have a few things to cover, so if it is taking too much time, we can move on. Basically, we are able to find it, like we are just have to come some of the... In yeah. the so, so I'll just uh, show you. So basically, uh, yeah, so if you just count the number of edges connecting to that, this, this is an undirected graph. So if you count the number of edges, uh, associated with each node, you'll find the degrees of each, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, degree associated with each node. And for the degree distribution, if you want to find the probability uh, probability values for the distribution plot, so you can just divide it by the total number of nodes that is present here, that is 10. So in that way, you'll get a probabilistic value. So these, uh, this, this uh, degree distribution that you can see, the, this is based on these values. Uh, so, uh, probability of degree 1 equal to 2 by 5, probability of degree 2 equal to 1 by 5. These values are plotted here, not the absolute degrees, just to be clear. So uh, yeah, in <clears throat> just to give you an like, idea how uh, you can calculate degree and make degree distributions. OK. So moving on, uh, we have next part. Next important topic here is uh, different types of paths and distances. I I'll just cover two paths here that I think uh, are like most relevant. First is the uh, uh, there are also other parts. Uh, you can see like the shortest path and the diameter, 
uh, shortest path and there are other paths as well i have not covered here so first is the characteristic path length it is basically uh, the av uh, sorry uh, the average uh, bit, uh, between the shortest paths between two vertices basically so in in if you uh, imagine your adjacency matrix it's basically uh, the average of all the non zero and the non infinity values in the matrix so uh, it's basically the if you if you calculate the shortest path between two nodes and you do that for all pair of nodes in the network and you average it out it's basically the characteristic path length and next is next important parameter is the network diameter it is if you you, you can imagine it in this way that basically the uh, the circle diameter is uh, connects the two farthest points in a circle uh, in the same analogy is uh, you can uh, like provide here as well uh, basically the path length between the two farthest nodes away uh, for farthest nodes in a network so how do you define farthest that is basically the longest shortest path between two nodes so in this case if you see this diagram uh, so the longest uh, shortest path between two nodes is between one and four so if you see one and five it is two if you see one and three it is two again uh, ju just between one and four it is three so that's the maximum uh, uh, maximum shortest length between any two pair of nodes in the network so that is the diameter and the shortest path is basically the the, uh, how, how the name suggests basically the, sh the shortest path. So the shortest path between uh, one and five will be one, two, five, not one, two, three, four, five. So basically there can be multiple ways to go from one node to another. The shortest path is the basically defined as the shortest path. And a path can be any path. So here see, uh, it, it is going from one to two, but going like it's crossing two ones, going to five, going to four again, and coming back to two again. This is also a path. This is just not a shortest path. So, yeah. Okay, then uh, we can move on to the next parameter that is the clustering coefficient. So, basically, the clustering coefficient uh, basically, uh, yeah, so clustering coefficient measures if you can think it in this way. So, say for example, you have three nodes A, B, and C. So, if A is connected to B, and A is connected to C, is B and C connected or not? That is what uh, uh, the smallest triangles are defined as. Those are known as cliques. And that is how that is what the clustering coefficient essentially measures. So how many, how much of cliqueiness you have in your network, how much tri how many triangles you're forming in your network. So basically, uh, a clustering coefficient is basically a measure of that only. So it is uh, defined as the uh, number of triangles connected to a node by divided by the basically number of triple centered node around IU. So basically, uh, if you have a node, say, if you have a node I, which is a set of, and there, there is a set of two edges connected to I, but those individual nodes that are connected to either those are not connected so kind of you're finding out how many triangles basically fraction of triangles that are present uh, within the within that part of the network number of cliques uh, fraction of the cliques present in that part of the network is kind of what you mean by clustering coefficient so what it gives is basically uh, how connected your individual components of your network are Can you, take a, a can you take an example and explain this? Um, I, I do not have the pen and paper. So if you have, can you just 
just uh, give us a couple of uh, minutes yuvram will just uh, draw something and show it so yeah. we'll take a simpler example see definition wise the easiest way to look at it is if you are a node and anything you are connected to is your friend you're basically seeing how well your friends are connected to each other that's in layman's terms okay so if uh, if you look at his first figure over here you have the node i let's say your node i and you're connected to four other nodes what you're trying to see is how well are those pairs of nodes connected to each other so that is what your clustering coefficient basically indicates so when you have a clustering coefficient it can go anywhere between 0 and 1 because it tells you how well your friends are connected whether they are connected completely like they all talk to each other or they don't talk to each other at all so in the first case you see c is equal to 1 where every one of the pairs of nodes i is connected to are connected to each other yeah. whereas in the last case is the other extreme where every one of the nodes i is connected to is not connected to anything else so conceptually that's a very easy thing to understand so any network you look at you look at if, and this is a node uh, property so when you look at any network you look at this particular node which you are interested in the clustering coefficient of that node is anything it's connected to is it connected to everything else to each other to anything else this is connected to that's all so the easy way to know about this how well do my friends know each other thank you yeah so yuvram will uh, in, in english show you some uh, example where you can actually calculate this yeah yeah uh, i will just share my screen yeah uh, do i need to stop sharing from just um, let me know whether you can see if not then... yeah you can see my screen? okay yeah, yeah. uh so basically clustering coefficient right so it's you can calculate it uh okay let's just see uh, for that so let's just go over it so let's take the node b so node b is connected to node a and node c right so a and c are its neighbor so basically what you are going to do is what are the number of uh so let's calculate cc for node b right uh okay so the denominator is going to be all the possible ways in which uh, the neighbors of b can be connected so here so how many neighbors do we have so for b we have two neighbors so what are the possible ways in which the two neighbors how many number of edges can be drawn between these two edges so what is the how do you find it so like it it is it is it is having two neighbors so huh so there's they, only one edge we can draw right yeah only one okay. edge can so let's just say you have uh, three nodes so how many possible edges can be drawn between these three nodes uh, minimum possible edges are two uh, maximum maximum the all combinations how do we figure that out easily so that will be nc2 ha ah, simple nc2 right hmm. so that's a, that is what going to be the numerator so numerator is going to be the number of neighbors you have choose to oh, sorry uh, the denominator is going to be number of neighbors you have choose to and then the numerator is going to be actual number of edges that is being observed in our uh, graph so in our graph we don't observe any uh, neighbors any edge between a and c which means it is going to be zero so this is going to be zero divided by 1 which is going to be 1 so we can do the same for uh, node d let's do that i'll just erase this so for node d so node d has three neighbors so it's going to be 3 choose 2 and then the numerator is going to be what is the actual number of edges between the neighbors so c and e we have one e and f we have another one we don't have anything between uh, other than that right right okay so it's just going to be 2 divided by 3 choose 2 whatever value we get so that fraction will be the clustering coefficient for node d and in this way you can calculate for all the nodes fine okay. so uh, is there any specific way of calculating it in the case of uh, directed graphs um in the case of i i'm uh, i don't think there is any uh, clustering coefficient defined for a, a directed graph uh, so clustering coefficient we use for under in the uh, undirected graph 
so I'm not sure whether there is a term called clustering coefficient for directed graph. But I will still check and I will get back to you on that. Maybe in the uh, Discord, I will uh, get back to you with that. Just wanted to confirm one more thing. Yeah. Whatever phenomena we covered in three, week three, so they are all applied. They all are applying on the uh, undirected graph. Yes. But which all phenomena are applicable on the directed graphs? That I just wanted to know. Like not now, but if in future, if we. Uh, okay. Okay, I will I will get back to you on that. Yeah, so I can tell you right now that metabolic networks, many of them could have direction because uh, when you when two reactants combine, you'll get a product so that has to go in a particular direction. If you're looking at gene regulation, one gene will regulate the expression of another. So there I would want to put a directed graph. So in biological networks, these two places at least you know you're using directed graphs. If I'm looking at protein interaction networks, if a protein is binding to another protein, it also means that the binding is going both ways. So that could be an undirected graph. No, Atman, I'm not asking this particular thing. I'm asking what I'm asking. These uh, like we are mentioning degrees, we are mentioning clustering coefficient, these central analysis things I'm asking. Yeah, so uh, it depends on the kind of questions you're going to ask. Like in a directed graph, I might want to ask about a path. Is there a path at all? So given that some of the edges could be directed, can I get from one end of the graph to the other? Because I can't go in both directions, obviously. So even if I have a fully connected graph, is it possible to go from one place to another? That can easily be a question applicable to a directed graph, right? Right. So path problems, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Uh, over to you, Sama. Uh, I guess you're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's visible now. Yeah. OK. So moving on to the next parameter is basically the closeness centrality. Uh, it's basically the inverse of the farness. Uh, uh, okay. uh, if you can define the farness centrality as an inverse of the closeness centrality, is basically the summation of all the distances between two pairs, uh, basically all the distances between any two pairs of nodes in a, in a network. And if you inverse that, if you sum that up and you inverse that, that's basically the closeness centrality. So basically, uh, if there are, uh, if, 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 if you imagine a node that is more centrally located than the node being located at one end of a graph, uh, the set more centrally no located node will have lesser uh, like uh, the path lengths of the centrally more centrally located node will be lesser uh, to other nodes compared to the node that is at one end of the graph. So, ki closeness centrality kinds of gives an, an as an idea ki where exactly in the in the no in the whole network the particular node is present. So, if your if your closeness centrality is basically uh, too low, it means it is as at one end of the graph. And the, and the distances between it and the rest of the nodes is very high. And uh, the opposite logic can be uh, uh, implemented in uh, when thinking about a node that is more centrally located. So it basically gives you about uh, like where exactly in your graph the node is located based on its distance compared to other nodes. So it can be regarded as a measure of how long it will take to spread information from that node to other nodes sequentially uh, uh, going along the edges. OK, so uh, the next parameter that comes is the between the centrality. So, between what is between the centrality exactly in layman's terms so if if you want to measure the between the centrality of a node what will it will the value will tell you is how the node is connecting to 
just a second. So, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, so, how, how it is acting as a bridge between uh, two other nodes. So, basically, if your node uh, is present in the shortest path connecting two node to other nodes or not, that is what betweenness centrality gives you. Basically, if you uh, if you like uh, think of the term at least, the, the betweenness centrality is basically how how the node is uh, present between two other nodes in terms of the shortest path. So in layman terms, this is what betweenness centrality is. But in term, more mathematical terms, it's basically the total number of shortest paths uh, between two nodes and how many of the shortest paths are going from the node of interest. That will be your you know, numerator and the total number of shortest paths between the two other nodes will be your denominator. So it, it is kind of fraction uh, that tells you on how many shortest paths is your node of interest sitting between two nodes. It is what uh, between its centrality is. You can read it uh, uh, on the screen. Uh, it's quite uh, uh, well explained. Yeah. So, uh, in in terms of like application uh, applications, you can think of a, more, a node having more between this centrality will be more uh, more involved in in different uh, pathways or different metabolic uh, reactions, if, uh, depending on the kind of network you're considering, it will be more involved in those processes because it is sitting uh, between two shortest paths, uh, between the shortest paths between two nodes. So you can think of it like that as well. Okay then, uh, moving on. Uh, this is the last topic that we'll cover today. Uh, after that, we'll after this we'll solve some questions, and if you have some doubts, we can answer those, those as well. So uh, this is the last topic that is random walk. So basically, what is random walk? It describes a path that consists of a succession of random steps. Uh, here it is uh, written on some mathematical space. Here, this, uh, uh, for our case, the mathematical space is the graph. So how you're moving from one node to another uh, is a walk. And if it is, if there is some randomness associated with it, so, so for example, you are uh, you are picking out of a distribution, uh, uh, and you, uh, with that probability, you are moving to another node. So that kind of quantifies as what we call as a random walk. So it's basically uh, how you are moving from one node to another, following the edge direct edge path between two nodes, and uh, basically in in some cases you'll have a termination condition. So for example, uh, you you are uh, doing a random walk on a graph, and your termination condition is if you come across the same node twice, your um, your work needs to be terminated, or some some sort of a condition like this. So, uh, for most cases, you will have a termination condition. Uh, you will not do a random walk forever. And depending on your condition, you'll you'll stop your random walk whenever that condition is met. So, one example would be to uh, uh, would be where uh, this method is used in studies of network vicinity of gene proteins. Uh, gene or proteins to study their functions. So basically, the idea is based on uh, uh, the method is based on the idea that the nodes related to similar functions they will be close to each other than in other networks. So uh, I'll go over a random walk a little bit more in the next slide. So uh, let's take an example here. So this is a graph uh, that is consisting of five nodes. So it's, it's basically uh, you're uh, doing random walk on this graph. Uh, you are moving from one node to another with a probability of one by degree of that node. 
So the probability you are using to go from one node to another, uh, in the example I talked about picking out of a distribution, random variable, but here it is basically one by degree of that node. So for example, uh, you start at node one, say for example. So for your iter first iteration of your uh, random walk, uh, you start at node one, it's, that's probability one. Now node one is connected to node two and node three. So, and both of this, uh, these nodes have one, two, basically like, so, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, you start from node one, then you move to node two or node three. So how would you move to node two or node three? That's dependent on like, basically there are only two paths. You can either move to node two or node three. So each will have a probability of 0.5. Now, say you are at node two, you, what is what are your options? You can move to node one, node four, or node three. So at each step, you calculate these iterations. So if you are at node three, you can move to node two, node four, node five. So each step you calculate what is the probability of moving and whichever is the highest probability edge, you move along that path until a certain condition is met. So in in this case the condition is not defined but they are looking to converge to a particular probability value so see after 30 iterations the probability if you sum up all the probability and take an average it will it is converging to a certain value so so from c from you know, like iteration 26 to 30 node one's probability is kind of constant 2.17 node three is 0 0.25 same with node four and node five so the more iterations you do the more uh iterations you do like you take an average of that you see the total probability to converge into a certain value and which will which basically gives you the in general probability of how much probability you have from moving to that node from your initial node so random walk kind of gives you uh uh the probability of to walk in each node in each iteration and uh, and how you can meaning like how is your probability converging to a certain value or uh, what, uh, how it is uh, going to that criteria that you define so yeah so you can go through it here uh, it is explained math the mathematical uh, Calculations are explained here. You can look at it here. Soma, there is a question in chat. So they are asking, is this uh, similar to page rank algorithm? Uh, I am not sure. I have to like uh, check. <clears throat> uh, page rank algorithm, I'm not very familiar with that. Oh, so you're talking about the Google search algorithm. Huh. That one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it is kind of uh, similar. Yeah. I, I was not familiar with the name. Yeah, it is it is similar. Yeah. Okay, then uh, this brings us to the end of the topics covered. You can ask your doubts. I am not sure if we are allowed to share these slides, you done, Arti? Uh, yeah, I guess we can share. Uh, we can share this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Piti, Pito Dev. Yeah. You can speak. Yeah. yeah uh, so, Somo sir, can yeah, I was about to ask about that uh, sharing of the slides. It would be helpful if you can put it within the lecture notes folder for week three. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Other folder that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll follow the protocol wherever uh, they ask us to share. We'll we will share. Them. No problem. Okay, okay. And uh, secondly, um, the there is this uh, subjective uh, co this coding assignment. Uh, of, for this for week three, uh, yes. I just want to verify whether that is uh, graded or ungraded, because that has hasn't been uh, as explicitly mentioned on the portal. Is this a graded assignment or is that just for practice? We'll check on it. Uh, we'll verify this and get back to you. Yeah.
Okay, you can can you put it on the chat space then, or or either on chat space or on the Discord. I put it in the chat space. I think okay. everybody is accessing the chat space. I think it comes as a notification to your phones. Whereas Discord, I think you'll have to specifically log in or something. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, officially Discord. I mean, both of it is fine. So yeah, whichever you feel convenient with. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll on the chat that. space itself, if you wish. Okay. Uh, yeah. My um, okay. One more doubt is, I mean, you can clarify both of them together when you post it. So, uh, firstly, number, uh, firstly, whether it is graded or not, mm -hmm. and uh, secondly, if it is a graded uh, assignment, then how will it be evaluated? Uh, will it be evaluated subjectively, or uh, or how will that work? Or uh, if possible, uh, can you provide any rubrics for the same? Yeah, yeah, we'll find out. We'll find out about that. Okay, okay, sure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I have just put that question in the chat box. So this is the coding assignment. Uh, but point B, I don't know if it is correct. Uh, to me, it looks like uh, this won't be a graded assignment because it looks like uh, someone has to look into it and verify your things, right? Yeah. So, the answer. so it looks like it is uh, ungraded. But still, I will check and I will get back to you on that. So had it been a graded assignment, generally there is a portal ID for that. It can automatically yeah, evaluate. So I guess uh, yeah. this cannot be automatically evaluated. So yeah, yeah you must do it manually if it is a Jupyter uh, notebook submission. Yeah. yeah. So this is for your practice, I guess. But still, I will uh, will confirm and then we'll get back to you on that. Sure, sure. And and in case it is actually graded, please uh, let us know about the rubrics uh, for the same. Sure, sure. Rubrics and uh, the evaluation criteria for that. Okay. Could you explain point B? So what is K here? I'm not sure. So K is the K is the degree. Okay. I'll just take a look and uh, maybe I will get back. I'm not yeah, sure. Basically, what they're asking you to do is uh, you have the number of nodes of degree K versus log of degree K. And they're asking you to see, is there a correlation between these two things? That's all. So you're taking log of both uh, um, X and Y axis, correct? Yeah, it looks like it's a log log plot. So it looks like you've got the log of the uh, Y axis, which is, yeah, X axis is going to have your log K. And your y-axis has got a uh, log of the number of nodes of degree k. So effectively, the probability of finding a node of degree k or the number of nodes which have a degree k. Effectively, the degree distribution which he showed you had something like that. Okay. And I suppose given any two set of uh, points, you can find out whether they have a correlation or not, right? I think that's what is being expected of you here. So network X has, uh, you can directly compute Pearson. I'm not sure about that. That is the part I'll need to verify. So plotting log N of K versus log K seems straightforward. Hmm. Okay. The Spearman correlation, uh, from what I understand of this, it looks like they're asking you to find out whether there is a correlation between the number of nodes of degree K versus the degree K itself when computed. That is whether it is a monotonic function or not. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Can you say something? as like n of k goes up what happens to k can you say is it positively or negatively correlated or something like that so when you choose a real world network can you find any trend like that okay so that looks like something which you can do right yeah so uh, only thing is pearman correlation coefficient is not directly available in network x uh, it is available uh, through that, exactly so that i need to verify whether you have to do it only through network x or whether you can just find out otherwise because the rest of it i think you can do the uh, things using network X itself. I guess you can find it out from other uh, packages also, because just uh, once you have these things calculated, there are going to be two vectors, right? So you can use any other packages and calculate the Spearman correlation. That should be good enough. But uh, what I understood from that, like uh, Spearman correlation coefficient would, would come out to be a single number. Huh. That's what so, you need. That yeah. will tell you whether it's correlated or not, first of all. And if so, is it positive or negative or something like that, right? Yeah. It, it that's all you need. It gives both the quantity, but uh, floating a single number, that's what we have. 
that we will first find out if it's evaluated. Only then do you have to worry about to which decimal you have to round it off and all that. No, no, not even rounding off is different thing. But plotting no, a single plotting, number definitely. Uh, you, you see, uh, plotting is you are going to calculate these two vectors. So log of n k and then log of k, and then this is the this is the thing that you are going to use to plot the distribution, right? Okay. So once you plotted, you are going to calculate the Spearman correlation between these two vectors. So right. Spearman correlation will be a single value, and then you just report this is the Spearman correlation between yeah log of n k and yeah. log of k. So fine, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So can can we expect? Yeah. Uh, uh, extended deadline for the at least for the grade if it is a graded assignment yeah if it is a graded assignment uh, we can have it but i i think it is not uh, but still i will confirm uh, and get back to you if it is graded then we can ask for an extension and we can figure out how this thing will be evaluated also sure sure thank you yeah, I had I had raised my doubt for the exact same question. I'm sorry, I had raised my hand for the exact same question actually, because okay. uh, the the deadline is day after tomorrow. So had it, I mean, if it is actually graded, then uh, it, it it is better if you inform us by tomorrow or maybe just extend the deadline for a few days if possible. Okay. Yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah, that we can. Yeah, we'll get back to you as soon as we get a reply on it. I've already posted the question. Okay. Sure. Sure, ma'am. Thanks. Yeah. Also, can we get the Jupyter notebook which Sir has used in the lecture? Uh, that should be in Unit 14. Supplementary materials, I think, should have been made available to you. I had already asked the team who were organizing it. Unit 14. Yes. Unit 14 has some supplementary material, and in that, the uh, I think the Jupyter notebooks are already there. I checked the content also. In the supplementary content of the Jupyter, there is no unit 14 in the Jupyter note. Uh, no, not, not exactly no. unit 14, but look okay, for the yeah. supplementary content in supplementary your... Supplementary uh, or reference material. Uh, there in should your be a portal, section. It should be there. Wait, okay, wait a minute. Maybe can other, others also check whether we yeah, have... It is, it is there. It, it is it there is sorted in the by folder. Yeah, ah. so there are different exactly. topics and they have exactly. been sorted out. Yeah, look for the topic. What has been scheduled? I'm not able to uh, even in the rep. Just look for supplementary uh, content in your portal. Uh, supplementary content, there should be a tab. And, uh, and after it, that, you should see Jupyter Notebook or reference. Uh, the materials last, the last option, right? Yes. Scroll down to the very bottom. The last option within supplementary contents is Jupyter Notebooks. Yes, that's right. So that, that is the content. Google Drive folder. Yes. In the Jupyter notebook, uh, I opened that, and in which module I will look? get it? Maybe Pradeep, can you uh, can you just? Yeah, I've shared the link in the chat box. Yeah, Charyan has shared the link to that in the in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, no, no, there are like uh, different uh, folders available in the in which uh, folder I will get the Jupyter notebook. Uh, of that particular just give me a sec i'm just opening it up yeah so you have some folders called zero network x and all right right yeah inside that you have some things on the edge list and program files and everything required some csvs and all in the zero folder right yeah in the zero folder will be the first one to start with i mean right. the title is already given there network structure network x those would be the basic ones network models would be your week four contents okay yeah so I think uh, zero and one should be like for week three, and uh, it looks like two and three would be for week four, and it looks like four and five would be after that for our section. Yes. Uh, zero may there was no data. Yeah, got it. It is in... okay. It is in like. Uh... One network, one network is true. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? Mm -hmm. 
No. Okay, if there are no questions, then we can end the end the session, I guess. So, do you guys have any any other questions than the coding assignment and the other things related to directed and undirected graph? Thank you so much. Okay. Okay yeah. then. Thanks. Thanks for the session. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.